So now we've come to the part in the program which I am always extremely excited about because, as you know, um, you know, startups at MIT have a very, very unique advantage. And one of those advantages is that the faculty at MIT, 1,000 of them, first of all, most of them started out. And their first question in the interview was not, you know, uh, how did you publish all those wonderful articles? It was, tell us about the impact that your research is going to make in industry and in other people's lives. Um, and that is the foundation of MIT since the beginning. Now, from, from about 1,000 uh, tenured faculty and, and about 2,000 other researchers, our data shows that about 175 of them are actually serially founding startup companies. That means not only are they themselves entrepreneurial, but they also provide for an immense inspiration and a pool of knowledge and wisdom that others can build on. So in no great measure is this the foundation for, you know, from, from which all of these innovations spring. Now, undoubtedly, the um, influx of new students every year clearly has also shaped the innovation ecosystem. So it wasn't to, not to say that. And as, as you may know, there's actually over 60 entrepreneurship and startup organizations on campus that sprung up, you know, in no measure just because students felt that they needed it. But the next speaker that I want to introduce, uh, Professor uh, Leonard Guarante is a MIT professor of biology. One of his uh, big research areas has been yeasts. And I am no biologist, but I do know this. Yeasts are an interesting microorganism. And in this new business of uh, nutrition, health, and wellness, it's interesting to see that this particular microorganism um, and, and, and biological structure has, has taken a, a center stage in some of the changes that we will see rolling in and some of the opportunities opening up. Um, other than that, he is a co-founder of a very interesting company called Elysium Health. Um, and I'm not going to reveal much about that company, just to say that it is an interesting health play in that they have chosen not to go for sort of FDA approval, as, as is my understanding of, of their uh, compounds, but to sort of stay in this intermediate category of nutraceuticals, which, uh, as far as I understand it, is sort of an in-between category of kind of like a food supplement and actually a pharma-grade type product, but that doesn't require an FDA approval. Um, it's a very interesting space. Um, I know that media has written about Elysium Health, that it is an anti-aging pill, so that should trigger your attention already right there. I mean, this is no small feats we are going to start uh, talking about. We have asked uh, Professor Guarante to talk about slowing the aging process by tweaking the body's metabolism, and he'll share some insights from the science and also from the commercialization of those attempts. And also, he will be kind of our, our leading scientific sounding board throughout the rest of the day to try to test you know, what, where's the hype and where's the reality, where's the science and where's the technology moving in this field. Without further ado, Lenny. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, dietary supplements are a $30 billion a year industry in this country. And that's amazing, uh, given that they don't work, and that most of the time, what they say is in the pill is not in the pill. So we, uh, a few years ago, decided uh, to start this company, Elysium Health, to identify natural compounds that really worked and to make them available to consumers in a time frame of one to two years instead of the 10 to 20 year timeline of a prescription drug. So there are really three pillars that uh, uh, underlie the uh, foundation of Elysium. The first is identifying these compounds, okay? And really that's only become possible, I would say, in the past five years or so because of the exploding literature in medical and scientific research that we can really say with some certainty now that at least in preclinical studies, these compounds work. Secondly, uh, we need to identify uh, a supplier that can make these uh, compounds in pure form. So we, we don't want to deal with extracts or herbs or anything like that. We want pure material only. Uh, in the pill. And third is to, to do the human trials that would show that these uh, compounds really work in people. Okay, so let me go through uh, a, a, an example now that will uh, also recap some of the science and 
it happens to be our first product, which has been available for about a year and a half now, called Basis. And Basis is really based on uh, research in my own lab. I've studied aging uh, here for about uh, 27, 28 years, and we started with yeast, uh, but we've gone on to more complex uh, organisms. And our work uh, in the first decade or so uh, identified a, a group of genes, uh, and there's proteins they encode, that are called sirtuins that we believe slow down the aging process. And we initially showed that in yeast, but it's also been uh, shown to be true in fruit flies, worms, mice, uh, probably uh, non-human primates, and it would be remarkable if it weren't true in humans. Now, sirtuins are, are, are very interesting uh, uh, genes and proteins, and in, when they're activated, uh, they confer good health. So an example of that is the diet of calorie restriction activates uh, these molecules, and calorie restriction uh, is associated with the prevention of many diseases in preclinical studies, which includes diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, uh, osteoporosis, inflammatory diseases, uh, the gamut of age-associated diseases. So that really, uh, uh, this is very interesting scientifically, but what made it actionable is uh, the discovery that well, I told you calorie restriction can activate these genes. It turns out that there are compounds that can do the same thing. And the original discovery was uh, by a former postdoc of mine of a compound in red wine. I'm sure many of you have heard red wine is good for you. So uh, one of the reasons is there's a natural compound, a polyphenol called resveratrol, in the red wine that activates one of these human sirtuins, called SIRT1 and uh, confers uh, health benefits, at least in preclinical studies. Although I must say, uh, further studies have shown that resveratrol itself is a, is a lousy compound because it's unstable, okay? But we've identified a, a relative of resveratrol that's much more stable, uh, works much better in preclinical studies. It's called terastilbene, uh, with a P. It's uh, found in blueberries, and it's one of the ingredients, one of two components of basis, okay? The other uh, part of the, the, the science that I want to track back to is we were interested in knowing exactly what these sirtuins do. And so we, we did uh, uh, what's called biochemistry, uh, which is tough, uh, to work out that they ha they're enzymes that carry out a particular reaction in cells that requires a molecule in cells that's present in all living cells called NAD. And NAD is a, a really important molecule for the cell to produce energy, to carry out metabolic reactions, to repair DNA, to repair damaged proteins. It's, it's a central molecule, okay? And NAD is essential for this activity of sirtuins. Now, what the plot thickened when it was found that as organisms age, NAD levels go down. So this has been shown to be true in worms, in mice, uh, in humans. NAD levels drop as we get older, and that's a problem because if there's not enough NAD, you don't activate sirtuins, metabolism goes awry, DNA repair goes awry, a lot of things go wrong. So it would be very nice if one could sustain high NAD levels. And um, it turns out that there are natural compounds. So cells make NAD, that's where it comes from. Uh, and they make it from, uh, in a stepwise manner. And it turns out there are precursors in that pathway of NAD synthesis that are present in the diet, but in extremely low levels. Uh, one of them is has a name, nicotinamide riboside, we call it NR, okay? And it's the immediate precursor of NAD. And it turns out that uh, if you give NR to, let's say, mice, okay, it's very efficiently transported into cells throughout the body, and the cells build it into NAD. So it's a very good way to boost NAD levels, okay? So we, we're really interested in, in this molecule. And, um, so it's the second component of basis. So we've identified suppliers now that supply us with both uh, terastilbene, the blueberry thing, and NR, the NAD booster, in pure form. That goes into the pill. And um, there have been numerous studies uh, done. Most of them were very small and uh, uh, showed safety of these compounds. But we carried out a more involved study uh, last year, human trial, 120 people, placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized, just like a drug company would do a trial. 
Um, and it was kind of a phase one trial, which uh, had two important outcomes for us. One is that indeed uh, it was demonstrated to be safe, which we already knew, but this is the, a larger study that shows that that's true, which has to be true of something that you're going to take uh, every day for the rest of your life, right? Secondly, uh, we measured NAD levels and uh, we showed a substantial increase in NAD levels in blood cells of people in the experimental group, but not the placebo group. So that's very good. And that was a two-month trial, and the NAD levels were not only raised, they were sustained for the duration of the trial. So th that works. So we're now currently uh, in the middle of doing uh, a large number of trials. Some uh, are being recruited. Some are in the planning stages. We're probably going to do six initiating this year based on more specific health endpoints. Um, and again, uh, you know, we have to uh, do this uh, uh, carefully uh, with regard to the FDA and so on and so forth, but that's all uh, uh, been taken care of. And we really hope to show uh, uh, a wealth of data for this product uh, in the next uh, period. So uh, that's, um, that's where we are with BASIS. We have uh, a lot of customers. And um, we have uh, mo most, of, in fact, of our FTEs are involved with interfacing with customers because we, we like to, uh, uh, we sell the, the product only online, okay, so you can only get it at ElysiumHealthOneWord.com. And the reason for that is um, we don't want people just, you know, buying it in a store. We want to have uh, a contact with our customers so that they have questions, they can contact us. And the website has a lot of information about the science behind the company, uh, about our extensive uh, scientific advisory board, uh, which has many uh, eminent scientists around the world. And um, our customers uh, uh, interact with uh, uh, employees in the company. That's their job. And so they can get questions answered. But we also get a lot of uh, tidbits of information by talking with our customers. And uh, that's called anecdotal data, but uh, one can convert anecdotal data into real data by doing a rigorous clinical trial. So it's a very interesting, I think, situation uh, uh, in the company, and uh, we're really hoping to disrupt uh, the nutraceutical industry and uh, maybe have ripples uh, that affect uh, the drug industry as well. So the uh, last part, and uh, I'm going to uh, leave time for, for questions and answers, is that uh, we're also, so Basis is the first product, but the company is not Basis and it's not aging. It's natural products that do something good. And so we have a, a pipeline that has the next series of products uh, planned. And again, these have been identified through the scientific literature. And we're presently uh, trying to get uh, uh, suppliers that can supply us with these molecules pure. That turns out to be really the limiting step in this process. It's not that easy to do, but we have to do it. Um, and we have uh, uh, human trials uh, planned once we have these compounds ready to go. And uh, we also have alliances with um, a number of universities, including uh, Harvard Medical School, Oxford, Cambridge, and we're part of the ILP. Uh, here and so we have a, a, a we're funding some research in some cases in other cases we have a window into research that's ongoing uh, to let potentially license IP that we might develop into still more uh, products moving forward so that's kind of the idea the vision of the company um, we um, uh, hope that uh, this model works because I think it would really make a difference um, in people's health and would add to all the wonderful things you've heard about this morning uh, and beyond in terms of medical devices and DNA analysis and motion sensors and so on and so forth so that people can uh, really uh, begin to uh, do what they want to do, which is to take charge of their own health. So, so I'll stop we now. Wanted to, uh, thank you very much. We wanted to see some, some fairly, you can clap first, obviously. <laughs> Let's see if there are some immediate questions. These are all, you know, also lightning s speeches. This is not the typical length of a professorial speech. But if you have a couple of questions, but then we'll, we'll go to uh, uh, the rest of the tea up. How does it work? Yeah. Why do you think wow. uh, dietary supplements don't work? Well, I, I've not, I shouldn't say not work. I should say have not been shown to work rigorously. 
okay? Because in order to show something works, it requires the kind of trial that I described, and uh, that hasn't been done. I mean, the classic case, I think, is vitamin C, which was, uh, uh, you know, very uh, strongly promoted by some very prominent people. Um, and there's still no evidence vitamin C, uh, in ex you know, excessive amounts of vitamin C does anything good. The only supplement, I'm, I, I should actually, uh, the exception to me, the exception that might prove the rule is that I think there's a good chance that uh, high doses of vitamin D are good, okay? Looking at the data, although there's, there's debate within, with, within the literature there, but I take vitamin D. Oh, also, I've been taking basis for three years, I should say. <laughs> Um, and uh, the other thing, just can I, just, sure. uh, people say, well, what, what should I feel? And um, yeah, it's a really interesting question because we do get, of course, people telling us they feel more energy, they feel they sleep better, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, it's not predicted that if you're healthy, you should feel anything. You know, you should just uh, uh, fall apart more slowly, right? And, <laughs> and, and how do you feel that? Uh, and that's part of, I should say, that's part of the challenge with the human trials, is how do you capture something you can measure in a two-month period? Okay? Think about that. All right, let's do one here. Yeah, so, what do you, what do, you do? Oh, you press it. Okay. Um, so, very interesting. The reason dietary supplements don't work is because you can't take a lousy diet and lifestyle and throw in some vitamin C or vitamin D and expect it to change anything. I mean, we don't eat individual nutrients, we eat foods that are part of a whole diet and that interact in ways that we can't possibly understand. So how, you know, how is your supplement basis, for example, and I'm not saying that it's not uh, something really great and effective, but you're still facing the same issue, that it's, it's a pill, it's one thing, and it's not gonna change everything else that a person is doing in terms of their lifestyle. Well, it's, it's not, but what distinguishes it from other, uh, every other virtually uh, supplement is the, the, the preclinical data, which is vast. And, you know, this isn't one laboratory. This is hundreds of laboratories that have shown, you know, in rodents there are these effects. Now, it's true. Mice are not humans. Not everything that works in mice works in people, which is why it's essential to do the human studies as well. But, you know, I think the combination of the preclinical data plus uh, the anecdotal data, frankly, that we have, uh, puts us in a position to, to make informed choices and in what to test for. Thank you. Uh, join me in thanking Professor, and uh, we will hold the rest of the questions for the panel debate, which is imminent. I just, we just need to get through these other two wonderful uh, introductions, and then you can ask all of your questions.